The 10th Academy Awards in 1938 honored the best films of 1937. It was the year Louise Reiner became the first actress to receive back-to-back -back Academy Awards. A lot of people don't know who Louise Reiner is, so maybe it's initially surprising that someone more obscure achieved something only Katherine Hepburn has ever replicated in this category. In this episode, I talk about why the studio system propelled Louise to success for a role she shouldn't have had in the first place, why her competition couldn't feasibly compete, and how, after just three years in the business, she disappeared. 1938 was a remarkable year in the Best Actress category because each woman nominated delivered performances that became career-defining. For Barbara Stanwyck, her turn as Stella Dallas cemented her as one of the greatest dramatic actors of her era. This heart-wrenching tale of a working-class woman who encounters class bias when she marries a rich man was a tremendous critical success. The LA Times said it was Barbara's finest performance to date. Several press outlets preemptively predicted that she would win the Academy Award. Irene Dunn gave what is now regarded as one of the finest performances of screwball comedy ever, alongside Cary Grant and The Awful Truth. Together, they play a married couple who begin divorce proceedings after unfounded suspicions pull them apart. Janet Gaynor also had one of her most memorable performances in the original A Star Is Born, playing an aspiring actress struggling to balance her deteriorating relationship with her self-destructive husband and her rise to fame. Greta Garbo, who was the untouchable reigning queen of Hollywood, received the best praise of her career for her performance in Camille. Plot-wise, Camille is very similar to Moulin Rouge, and Garbo is perfectly suited to its romantic and sacrificial melodrama. She even received the New York Critics Circle Award for her work. But Louise Reiner playing Olan, the Chinese farmer fighting to survive famine in the good earth, walked away with the award. Considering how well-remembered and well-received her fellow nominees' performances were, we have to ask, what made Louise stand out? When you dig deeper than reviews, you realize that the studio's influence on the Academy gave Louise the upper hand. Louise became an MGM contract player when Louis B. Mayer recruited her from Germany in the mid-1930s, confident she could become the next big thing. She later explained, quote, he thought I could become a big star. He wanted to build me up like Garbo. She was the crown jewel of MGM, and he felt that I had equal possibilities. So upon her arrival in Hollywood, MGM orchestrated an extensive publicity campaign to introduce their brand new dramatic lead. The next year, as if by Mare's prophecy, she won her first Academy Award for her second film ever, The Great Ziegfeld. Mare immediately began to search for the next project to solidify Louise's status as the new crown jewel of MGM, when producer Irving Thalberg suggested his pet project, a film version of the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Good Earth. For reasons we'll discuss later, Louise fell into the role of Olan, both the film and Louise were lauded for their interpretations of the beloved novel. Even though her role was relatively small compared to those of her fellow nominees, Louise won. As film historian Emmanuel Levy notes, there have always been efforts to persuade members of the Academy to vote a particular way. In the 1930s, the most significant efforts to draw attention to quote, Oscar worthy achievements came directly from the studios and no studio was better at that publicity machine than MGM. Louis B. Mayer was a charter founder of the Academy and was instrumental in recruiting its new members. Under his leadership in the 1930s, MGM earned 153 nominations and 33 awards, more than any other studio. Compare Paramount in second place with only 102 nominations and 18 awards. Fully half of all acting Oscars awarded in the 1930s were given to MGM's contract players. But not everyone chose to commit to a studio like Louise. A handful chose to freelance instead. And oddly enough, in 1938, three of the five nominees were freelancers. Barbara Stanwyck freelanced since the beginning of her career, opting to sign limited non-option contracts, usually for one film at a time. In 1937 alone, she had contracts with four studios, RKO, Paramount, and Fox, and with independent producer Samuel Goldwyn. Irene Dunn also began to freelance in the 1930s, jumping from Columbia to Paramount and Universal all within the course of two years. 
Janet Gaynor had a long-term contract with Fox for a majority of her career that she let expire after Fox's merger with 20th Century. After that, she freelanced consecutive one-picture deals with independent producer David O. Selznick. Freelancing definitely had its benefits, like greater artistic freedom and the ability to avoid typecasting. This is how, for example, Barbara Stanwyck, who was equally adept in comedies like Ball of Fire as she was in noirs like Double Indemnity, managed to show such versatility. But freelancing also denied stars the same resources and facilities of the major studios to execute sophisticated and powerful publicity campaigns on their behalf. More than anything, studios wanted loyalty. And if an actor committed to a roster, they would whip up any votes they could to ensure a victory. Barbara Stanwyck and Irene Dunn never won Oscars, which is truly shameful considering their bodies of work. Janet won the first Best Actress Oscar in 1928 while working for Fox. Of course, each year is different, and there were probably factors contributing to this fact more than just contractual politics. But one has to wonder, would things be different if they had MGM's full-time support? But what about Greta Garbo? Greta Garbo was in a long-term contract and at MGM. So given their record, her status as queen of the screen, and her notices for Camille, why Louise and not her? The short answer is, Louis B. Mayer was in Louise's corner, and he wasn't in Greta's. By the time Garbo made her third film, The Flesh and the Devil, in 1927, it was obvious that she was the biggest star Hollywood had ever seen. Her success was enormous, and the studio couldn't have been more thrilled. Garbo, however, had some concerns. She wasn't happy that MGM kept casting her in vampy roles. And then she found out her co-star, John Gilbert, was earning $10,000 a week, compared to her $200 a week. She approached Mayer and asked for a renegotiation of her contract with a higher salary and greater creative control. He did everything to try to force her into submission, from threatening to deport her back to Sweden to initiating a publicity campaign calling her a megalomaniac. Garbo held out and even prematurely shut down a shoot waiting for Mayer to comply. Finally, MGM executives convinced Mayer to acquiesce. She was the studio's greatest asset. They needed her. He gave her the contract she wanted, but their relationship never recovered. In his eyes, she wasn't a team player. She didn't enjoy the press, wearing makeup or dresses, or socializing with Hollywood elites. And this partially explains why he was constantly searching for a new Garbo, which he thought he had in Louise. But at the end of the day, the joke was on him. Everything Garbo hated about Hollywood, Louise hated too, and she had much less patience for it. Notoriously averse to celebrity culture, Louise almost didn't show up to accept her second Oscar. When Mayer realized that she wasn't in attendance that night, he angrily sent MGM employees to her house, where they found her in pajamas with her hair in curlers, preparing for a night at home. Reluctantly, she headed to the ceremony to receive her award at the last minute. But not long after, she openly spoke with the press about how unhappy she was in Hollywood. She felt trapped in the MGM machine and eventually began refusing roles. The few she did take were poorly received. And by that December, fan magazines were running Whatever Happened to Louise Reiner articles. Louise's career plummeted so quickly that gossip columnist Luella Parsons was prompted to coin the phrase Oscar curse. In 1939, Louise broke her contract with MGM and left after just three years in the business. And Mayer saw to it that she never came back, apparently saying, quote, we made you and we're going to kill you. If I may editorialize, I have a hard time with this Oscar. Perhaps it's my modern lens, but I don't personally find Louise's performance here compelling. Olan doesn't have a ton of lines, so she kind of overcompensates with an exaggerated weariness that, coupled with her heavy contouring, reads more like a zombie than a resilient farmer. Plus, with such stellar competition and the benefit of hindsight, knowing that not much would come of this later, you wish someone else could have gotten the attention that night. But the truth of the matter is, the person who should have gotten that attention wasn't even invited to the ceremony. If at any point during this video you thought, wait, 
Isn't the good earth about Chinese farmers? And isn't Louise Reiner German? Isn't this super racist? You're correct. The good earth is one of many examples of yellow face in Hollywood history, a tradition that it has yet to fully abandon. Just ask Scarlett Johansson. But this example is especially disheartening because it exposes one of the clearest instances of institutional and systemic racism against actors of color. Anna Mae Wong was the only Chinese star by any measure in the 20s and 30s. She had survived the transition from silent to sound films and gained fame from scene-stealing performances in films like Shanghai Express. Anna's career was restricted and defined by her heritage. Studios only cast her as otherized, mystical, or dangerous Asian stereotypes. But when Anna heard that MGM was filming The Good Earth, she had hope. Finally, there was an opportunity to play an Asian character who wasn't marginalized by race. She really wanted to play Olan and campaigned for it hard. But when Thalberg cast Paul Muni as the lead male role, he effectively destroyed Anna's shot at Olan. The Hayes Code, which outlined the moral guidelines for what could and could not be shown in film, banned interracial relationships on screen. So because Paul was white, Anna couldn't play his wife. Louise could, so she stepped in and played a Chinese peasant with a heavy German accent. As a consolation, Thalberg offered Anna the role of Lotus, a concubine and the film's least sympathetic character. Justifiably furious, Anna didn't want to represent her heritage that way. She refused, and the role was given to another German, Tilly Losch. Louise Reiner's career is so briefly significant. It revealed flaws in the star-making system and represented Mare's misplaced faith. Other actresses didn't have the same privilege of studios going to bat for them at a time when studios had an outsized influence on the Academy. And still others suffered from the oppressive hand of white privilege. Whether she deserved it or not, Louise Reiner staked her claim on Academy history with her consecutive wins. And that, at least, is worth remembering. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye.